Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kilowatt, a podcast about electric vehicles, renewable energy, autonomous driving, and much, much more. My name is Bodie, and I am your host. And on today's episode, uh, I, I have to apologize because this is a very late episode. And I don't know if it's because it's hot outside or if uh, there's a cold floating around, uh, at least in the Phoenix area. Uh, I, I don't know what it is, but I just have not felt my best the last couple of days. I won't go into the gross details, but a lot of fatigue and just kind of tiredness, which I guess is fatigue. <laughs> but anyway, the point is uh, maybe some body aches. Uh, the point is that uh, I don't really have a good excuse. I just have not really had the energy to do much of anything. So uh, I did write this over the last three or four days of this episode, and it was it was uh, it was quite difficult to get it all written. And it's not that's not very typical. I can usually write these things in a couple hours. These episodes, so uh, just laying that out there so everybody knows it wasn't because i didn't want to it was just i didn't feel good uh and i don't feel good but do you know what helps me feel better is when we get a new patreon subscriber and we did we have brad brad thank you so much for joining the kilowatt patreon brad went to patreon.com forward slash kilowatt and signed up to support the show for which i am eternally grateful so brad thank you so much i sent you uh, a message through patreon if you need any help setting up your patreon feed or just have any questions please feel free to reach out to me i am more than happy to help you out with whatever you need and again thank you very much for doing that Next up, we have a little update. A few weeks ago, I said that Tesla was replacing some of the drive units on Cybertrucks that had already been sold. So they're reaching out to owners. They're like, hey, we want to replace this drive unit. Bring it on in. And I thought that that might be suspicious. I didn't know if that was typical or normal in the automotive industry. Joseph sent in an email letting me know that Chevy actually offered him $500 to do some testing on his Chevy pickup. So this this may be just a totally normal thing in the, the automotive industry. As a matter of fact, it looks like it is a normal thing in the automotive industry. So thanks to Joseph for uh, giving us that update. All right, let's start with our EV news. VinFast is delaying their North Carolina EV factory until 2028. The only reason they gave us was economic headwinds. That was That was the only reason. So we'll we'll believe them and see what happens. Uh, I do like Vinfast as a company. I've driven their vehicle, uh, the VF8, and it was a fine vehicle. You know, it wasn't like blow you out of the water, but it was it was fine. But I think more importantly, the more options we have here in the United States at different price points, the better we are as uh, consumers, and not just here, everywhere. I shouldn't specifically just say the United States since this is an international show. All right, Electrify America is piloting a program to reduce congestion called the Congestion Reduction Pilot. We'll build a little bit on the nose with the name there. The goal is to let people charge their vehicle to 85% and then boot them off. You do have a 10-minute grace period until you start getting hit with idle fees, but once you hit 85%, you're gone. And I know what some of you are thinking, what if you're on a road trip and you need that little bit of extra energy? Well, Electrify America is only using high utilization locations that aren't typically used for road trips. So think folks charging their vehicles who may live in apartments or don't have a charger at home for whatever reason. It's those chargers that they are they are uh, targeting in this pilot program. That doesn't mean that somebody wouldn't use them for road trips. It just means the likelihood is much lower. It seems like they could have done something like this during high utilization times. I'm certain that there are times when these chargers in the pilot program are not at high utilization. There may be a time when there's nobody using them when you pull up or there is, you know, three or four open stalls. Maybe at that point you don't kick people off at 85 percent. Maybe you say you can charge to 100, but when we're at 90 percent capacity, that's when we're going to kick people off at 85 percent. Because it doesn't make sense that 2 a.m. and you're the only person there and you want to charge your car so you can get to your next destination and you need 95%. It doesn't make much sense to kick you off at 85% in that situation. But I do recognize the need to reduce 
congestion at these charging uh, stations. I've, I've felt the pain myself, and it's never fun, to be honest with you. Volkswagen Group has pushed back the release of some of their upcoming EVs, like the successor to the ID4, the Porsche Macan SUV, the Audi e-tron Q6, just to name a few. And it sounds like the uh, software is to blame. It seems like these vehicles were going to be based on their new SSP platform, and the software for that platform is not ready. And it could be pushed back as far as 2029, which is insane. That doesn't mean that Volkswagen's not updating their platform. They do have the MEB Plus platform, which is obviously an improvement on the MEB platform, but the SPP platform was supposed to be their next generation. I don't have any idea if the Rivian and Volkswagen Group partnership would help out with the SPP platform, or if that's something that it's, it's Volkswagen is developing in-house entirely. I, I have no idea on that. But uh, as we find out more, I will let you know. Lucid announced their delivery numbers and they beat estimates for Q2 2024. So they produced 2,110 vehicles during that quarter, which is actually down 3% year over year. But they delivered 2,394 vehicles, which is actually up. 71% year over year. So the delivery is quite a bit better than last year. So not too shabby for Lucid. Uh, they were estimated to deliver 1,940 vehicles. So they they beat it by a, a good amount, a good percentage when you compare low numbers to low numbers. It's still a good percentage. Their overall goal for 2024 is to deliver 9,000 vehicles. And at this moment... I didn't write the number down, but I think they're a little less than half of that their goal. So they need to be at 4,500 vehicles for the first half of 2024. I think they're right around 3,900, something like that. I didn't write the number down, but they're not quite to where they need to be to reach their 9,000 vehicle goal unless they really increase uh, production and deliveries in the second half of 2024. And since we're on the topic of Lucid, they recalled 5,251 errors for errors, you know, Lucid errors, for a software issue that could cause the car to lose power. This is due to a high voltage interlock safety mechanism that could be triggered if the car is in driver reverse, which, you know, that's a good part of the car's time spent moving is in driver reverse. Uh, this HVIL is used during assembly, inspection, maintenance, and repair. So I don't know why it is uh, uh, causing this software issue, but it can be fixed by an over-the-air update. But if you happen to listen to this show and you own one of those Lucid Airs, just know that this can happen and there's a software update on the way. GM and Stellantis will receive close to $1.1 billion in funding that will go towards their EV efforts. So there's a total of $1.7 billion made available via the Inflation Reduction Act for automakers to update their factories. GM will get $500 million and Stellantis will get the other 600-ish million dollars. I think it ends up being a little bit less than $600 million, but if we're rounding up, we'll say $600 million. Stellantis and GM were given the lion's share of that government money. I do wish that this money would be given to smaller EV automakers like Rivian, Lucid, Aptera. You know, I'm not sure that five to six hundred million dollars is a lot of money for companies like Ford, GM, Stellantis, Volkswagen, Hyundai. I mean, it's a lot of money. It's still five hundred million dollars, no matter which way you slice it. But it's a lot of money for smaller companies in not as much money for these larger companies. So I would have liked to see that go toward the uh, smaller companies. All right, let's talk about Chevy's new 2025 Equinox EV. More specifically, the fabled $35,000 version. Now, the 2024 model of the 1LT, which is the base model, that is coming out at the end of the year. So this is next year's model, 2025. So... First, I want to say 1LT F will drive, front wheel drive. 
uh, is not the greatest naming uh, convention for their trims. Uh, I, I, I think that GM needs to get away from uh, these terrible, terrible names. 1LT FWD is the name of this trim. That's just terrible. So come up with something more creative. I'm sure you happen to have a really great marketing team. So it's going to get a little more power. Uh, not much, but a little bit. Uh, it's going to go from 213 horsepower for the 2024 to 220 horsepower for the um, 2025. But here's the thing, 315 miles of range, which is really good. And especially when you're talking about a $35,000 car, which I don't think we know at this point whether or not it's going to qualify for the Inflation Reduction Act. But if it does, that gets that car under $30,000. That's that's pretty good. It's a pretty good number. And from everything I'm reading, the Equinox EV, the 2LT that's out now, is uh, it's getting pretty good reviews. So the whole reason why I wanted to bring this up was not to highlight an increase in seven horsepower, but we're actually getting the $35,000 version and it's got really good range. We're not dealing with $35,000 uh, and you know, 240 miles where, where it's $35,000 and 315 miles, as long as GM um, keeps their promise, which I have no reason to believe that they won't. However, I also have no reason to believe that they're going to make money on this car, but I love that they are doing it. All right. Staying on the topic of GM, Tim Levin at Inside EVs isn't bothered that GM is planning to do away with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Tim drove the new Cadillac Lyric for a week, and part of his testing included the new Android-based infotainment system. And here are his thoughts. Actually, you know, before we do that, we should say that the Android-based infotainment system that GM is using is a Google uh, uh, software package that is different than Android Auto. So it's not Android Auto. It's completely different than that. But this, this Cadillac Cleric had GM's new infotainment system, which is Android-based, and CarPlay. So this is what he said about it. He used both infotainment systems, and he said that when he was using GM's system, it worked great and, in some cases, even outperformed CarPlay. And actually, I'm going to read a quote here uh, from him. All in all, the Lyrics interface is attractively designed, straightforward enough to read at a glance, and highly responsive to taps and swipes. Its polished feel and configurability give off some tech product vibes, even if it, is, even if it isn't quite as dazzling as what you'd find on a Tesla or an iPad. And then he goes on to talk about the actual system itself and how it's built on Android Automotive and all that stuff, but we're not going to get into that. Um, one of the things that I found interesting is that he mentions that it has a polished feel, you know, swipes and taps are responsive, but not as responsive as an iPad or a Tesla. And I would argue that if you are somebody that is used to that kind of responsiveness that you would find on, you know, really good Android phones, iPhone, iPad, Tesla, if you were used to having that responsiveness, it might feel sluggish to you. I'm not throwing shade at GM because when they first announced this, I said, if you don't do this really well, uh, people are going to hate it and they're going to hate you. And it looks like GM's done this really well. I'm just saying, if you're comparing it to an iPad or a Tesla, for instance, and it isn't as dazzling as what you would find in a Tesla or an iPad, there's probably a little bit more work to be done. Does that mean it's bad? Absolutely not. It just means if you're used to those two systems or systems similar to that, you might find it to maybe be sluggish or maybe not as full featured as you would like it to be. Um, but he did say that when he was using the GM infotainment system, he didn't feel the need uh, or didn't miss CarPlay. The apps he used the most were Google Maps and Spotify, and they were very useful. Some of the other apps that he highlighted were Audible, Tidal, YouTube Music, PlugShare, and Waze. At this time, Apple Music wasn't available, but I would imagine will be available at some point. In order to use 
these apps, you'll need internet access. And this is where it gets a little bit confusing. And I know that we have somebody in our audience that just got a brand new Silverado EV, which I have seen three in the last couple of days. I've seen three Silverado's EVs. One was at the dealership and two were on the road. And they do look very nice. Uh, but since we have a person in the audience, maybe they can correct me on this if I am wrong. Bodie, B-O-D-I-E at 918digital.com. But this is how GM does their internet access. They have two classifications. The first, and they call it connectivity, so we're going to call it connectivity from here on out instead of, of internet access. But connectivity for native apps like Google Maps or Google Assistant, things that come with the Android automotive uh base software that they've built their whole infotainment system on. So that is one category of connectivity. The other one is connectivity for third-party app access like Spotify and Audible. It sounds like there's going to be two plans. One is $15 a month and the other is $25 a month. But I will say, I went to the <laughs> OnStar's website to find the pricing for this because it all goes through OnStar. And there's a bunch of different plans. So I, I, it's really hard for me to sort this out. If, it is, if there is a $15 a month plan, which it looks like there is, that's going to get you basic connectivity for your apps. So if you want to listen to Spotify, you're going to be able to listen to Spotify. But they might, there might be a cap involved in that. But for $25, you could stream or not stream. You could connect seven different devices to the in-car Wi-Fi network and you can, you know, stream your movies, download games or whatever th through uh, the service that way. I'm not really sure that I would want to pay $25 a month just so my kids could have internet in the car. However, if I was part of a carpool and those employees wanted to contribute to the $25 a month, uh, I, I would be down with that. That wouldn't bother me much. But otherwise, I just don't think it's worth it to me. I will say that GM does give uh, a specific amount of time for free when you buy the cars. I think it's it's like eight years for the built-in services like Google Maps and uh, Google Assistant. And then it's like three years for just general app access like Audible and Spotify and YouTube music and stuff like that. So you get a little bit of free time when you purchase the car just to get you started off, but eventually you're going to have to start paying. All right, let's move on to our Tesla news. It sounds like Tesla may be delaying the RoboTaxi event. Initially, it was supposed to take place on August 8th, 2024. Bloomberg is now reporting that the RoboTaxi team needs more time to build some additional prototypes. So we may be looking at a, an event in October although Tesla has not made an official announcement. Model Y rear-wheel drive owners can now pay for an additional 30 to 50 miles of range. So for $1,000 or $33 a mile, they can get an additional 30 miles of range. If they want 50, they're going to pay $1,600 or $32 a mile for 50 miles of range. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure how I feel about this. On one hand, trying to keep costs down and make vehicles more affordable, that makes a lot of sense to me. But that's Tesla's not losing money on the the rear wheel drive Model Y. You know, uh, whoever buys that car is paying for every single cell that's in the car, whether it's active or not. Uh, so I could see this biting Tesla in the backside because, you know, there's a fine line between gouging customers and making money. So if someone bought that car and they paid for those cells that are in that car, uh, and it, you're going to really have, have a hard time convincing me that Tesla didn't charge them for those cells, then, um, I think this is a bad move on Tesla part, Tesla's part. It's a bit like charging money for heated seats you know, or charging a subscription for heated seats. The seats are already in the car. You've already purchased that, hard, that, that hardware in the car. Turning that feature on should not be a monthly service or an additional cost. It, it feels predatory to me. This is not a software service. I am okay for paying, service, paying for services like connectivity, 
or uh, you know, full self-driving, that kind of thing. I'm okay paying a little bit of money for that, but I am not okay with paying money for hardware that you've already purchased and uh, unlocking it. Now, on the other side of things, a few years ago in Canada, some of Tesla's vehicles were bumping up against the threshold for some of the incentives they had for EVs. And in that situation, if Tesla was to software lock the battery, let's say, uh, let's say they took 50 miles out of the car and they dropped the price $1,000 so that the owners could qualify for those incentives, then I could see why you would do it in that situation because the person buying the car could pay the $1,000 later and unlock that extra 50 miles or not. It's up to them. Uh, but the reason why Tesla is doing that is to bring the cost down to something that's underneath the threshold for those incentives. Uh, I still don't think that's a really good example, but I could see doing something like that in the event that you're bumping up against those incentive thresholds. But yeah, um, we'll see what happens. Uh, I, I think Tesla should just give these people their 50 miles and not charge them all this money. Tesla has launched a new Model 3 long range trim. Tesla already has a all wheel drive long range version but the newest long range version is a rear wheel drive model. Now I think Tesla needs to, <laughs> like I said, GM needs to clean up some of their, their trim uh, naming conventions. Tesla's if they're going to start doing this kind of thing, they also need to do that as well on their side. Cause you have a long range rear wheel drive and long range all wheel drive. Now, anyway, this uh, vehicle is zero to 60 in 4.9 seconds. 363 miles of range, which is really good, and uh, $42,490 before incentives. So right now, Tesla has four Model 3 trims. They have the, at the base, they just have a rear wheel drive model. It is $38,990. It has 272 miles of range, and it does not qualify in the United States for any Inflation Reduction Act money. But the long range rear wheel drive, the one we just talked about for $42,490, it does qualify. The long range all wheel drive, which is $5,000 more, $47,490 with 340 miles of range, also qualifies for the incentive money, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act money. And then you have the performance, which is all wheel drive, cost $54,990, 303 miles of range, but it is zero to 60 in 2.9 seconds. So having four trims, four different trims for the Model 3 seems a little strange for Tesla, simply because they've always only had three. Like at one point in time, they had a ton of different things you could customize on the Model S. And they said, you know what? We're going to simplify this because it's costing us too much money. All these customization uh, options are just costing way too much money. So we're going to we're going to make it super basic and super compelling. I wouldn't be surprised if Tesla looks at the sales numbers over the next few months and drops one of these lower end trims. The Tesla Fremont factory has been ordered by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District to correct some air quality violations. It seems like most of these violations are in reference to the paint shop. The violations date back to 2019, and there are over 112 violations that have yet to be corrected. Each violation could be contributing hundreds of pounds of pollutants into the air. Sounds like the issue has to do with the thermal oxidizer and some of the other pieces in the abatement system. Uh, the problem is that these pieces readily break, which causes emissions to be automatically vented directly into the air without any sort of abatement. And that is an issue. And again, been going on since 2019. So Tesla was ordered to implement a two-step plan. I'm just going to read it directly here. First, hire a third-party consultant to do an evaluation and make recommendations. Tesla must then develop a proposed implementation plan to implement the recommendations which it will file with the hearing board for approval 
Second, execute the implementation plan as approved by the hearing board to stop the avoidable release of uncontrolled emissions, except where it may be absolutely necessary for safety reasons. So, yeah, I mean, this totally makes sense. And if this has been going on since 2019, shame on Tesla. All right, our last story isn't really a Tesla story, but it, it, it kind of related to what Tesla does. A report by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety and the Highway Loss Data Institute studied information on crashes from BMWs and Nissans, and they found that features like adaptive cruise control and lane centering, what they're calling partial automation systems, offered no measurable safety improvement when it comes to car accidents. In fact, these systems could actually be more dangerous, according to IIHS President David Harkey. This is what he had to say. Everything we're seeing tells us that partial automation is a convenience feature like power windows or heated seats rather than a safety technology. Partial automated systems can induce uh, driver complacency and distraction. Now, I know that there are some of you that there's like steam coming out of your ears and you're ready to email me and light me up about what a nonsense story this is. Hold on one second. What they did find was that the crash avoidance systems like front automatic braking, emergency braking, like somebody slams on the brake in front of you and your car slams on its brake, blind spot warnings and lane departure prevention, all of those increased safety. Uh, of course, in, in any of these studies, further research is needed to assess newer vehicles and their safety impacts. So let's just kind of get that out there. But the reason why I chose to do this story today is not because that this information is particularly like groundbreaking, because that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, things like uh, lane keep assist and things like that. That that that's more for your convenience. I get that. The reason why I brought this up is because these these systems are all kind of like shoved together in the autonomous driving field, and they are all kind of matched mashed up under one category. And I think what we need to be looking at is these features as convenience features and safety features. And I know for me, as somebody who's done a podcast for the last eight years for this, I'm coming up on eight years in August, it'll be eight years. Um, I match all of these mash, all of these features together as autonomous driving features. And in reality, I should be looking at them and we all should be as convenience features versus safety features because these are all different systems but they tend to be packaged together as one system like here's your you know level three if you're mercedes autonomous driving system pilot or whatever mercedes calls it and that's great except for from a, a more if we're going to look at it from a more critical perspective we should be looking at it, oh, this is a convenience feature and this is a safety feature. Obviously, I don't want a convenience feature being unsafe, but if we're gonna talk about how safe a system is, we shouldn't be measuring that by how well it stays in a lane. Obviously, we don't want it to go outside of a lane and fail and cause a crash, but we should be looking at the actual safety features versus the convenience features. So this kind of opened my eyes a little bit. I'm kind of curious as to what you think on this. If you want to email me, it's Bodie, B-O-D-I-E at 918digital.com. You can also find me on X at 918digital. But again, I really want to know what your thoughts are on this because honestly, when I saw the headline, I was ready to rip it apart uh, on the show. And then when I read through this, I was like, maybe I'm looking at this the wrong way. So I, I'm curious about your thoughts. All right, everybody, that is it for me. I've already given you my email and my X uh, account. You can also, oh, hey, brand new episode of Beyond the Post released last Wednesday, and Lamar Wilson is on the show. 
Lamar Wilson is a social media and YouTube personality. He is the CEO of Unboxing, and he's a heck of a nice guy. So if you're curious as to what it's like to be a successful creator, don't ask me because I'm not one. <laughs> ask Lamar. It was so good, we had to turn it into a two-part episode. All right, everybody, that is it for me today. I will talk to you for sure on Tuesday. Tuesday.